All right. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, my name is Christian Barlow, and I will be co-presenting this tutorial together with uh, Cheng Feng Zai. Maybe uh, people. <laughs> Uh, so this is a tutorial about user simulation for evaluating information access systems on the web. And if you are attending the, this is us, if you are attending this conference, then you might have seen these other two tutorials um, that are related, uh, both were given yesterday. Uh, the first one was uh, large language model powered agents in the web. And they had the broader coverage of large language model powered uh, agents, which can also be used to simulate users. The other related tutorial was uh, also about simulation, but simulating human society, also with the uh, LLM driven agents. And that tutorial had a broader uh, coverage of agent based uh, simulation, and in particular, uh, uh, using uh, large language model based agents. So our tutorial nicely complements these two. We try to avoid the overlap. So we will be particularly focusing on the use of user simulation for evaluation purposes. And for those purposes, we want these models to be interpretable. And we will be focusing on simulating interactions with different information access systems that are common on the web. So that's, uh, that's our relation to those tutorials. But those are also highly related and recommended. Okay, so this is the plan for today. Uh, we will be taking turns in, in uh, uh, presenting the material and I will start with giving some introduction and uh, background. Uh, before I want to mention that uh, the, tut uh, the material that will be presented today is based on the book uh, that is uh, submitted to the foundations and trends in information retrieval. It's, uh, currently under review and it's available on archive and uh, this is a this is a living draft uh, an update is coming very soon and even after the book is published we uh, have the ambition of keeping it uh, up to date and there's also a website i will come back to that that is uh, uh, meant to host uh, resources as well as bring the community together okay so we are uh, doing simulation in the context of intelligent interactive systems and these systems uh, aim to support users in finishing some task and uh, this is a, a collaborative uh, scenario where the user and the system take turns uh, and they together work towards accomplishing that shared objective now uh, the system wants to optimize the, the the interactions for the user and for that it needs to have some model of the user so that it can uh, have uh, personalized uh, interactions. And as a special case, we will be focusing on information access systems, which are uh, arguably one of the most useful slash advanced interactive uh, systems so far. These systems uh, aim to help users find information and uh, you can think of search engines and recommender systems, uh, more recently conversational assistants that aim to provide uh, access to the right information in the right format at the right time. And generally, the interactions with these systems involve the user somehow expressing some information need, either by typing a queries or prompt or interacting with items. And uh, the system presents uh, these information objects, which can be documents, images, videos, and so on, in some modality or combination of modalities. And the evaluation of these systems is an open challenge. Uh, we can distinguish between different modes of information access. The first one is pool mode, when the user is driving the interaction. This is typical uh, of the, the way we interact with search engines. The user enters a query, and in response, the system returns the answers. Uh, in push mode, the system takes the initiative. That's uh, typical of uh, recommender systems that uh, you know, give uh, suggestions based on the user's past history. And uh, these two tasks might be seen as two sides of the same coin, and uh, they involve uh, very similar steps. 
So they need to model somehow the user's information, need and preferences, and match this with the information objects, then present those somehow to the user and learn from feedback. Uh, in a mixed initiative setting, uh, which is uh, typical of conversational assistants, uh, the system can uh, also take initiative and the system and the user uh, together drive the, the interaction. In terms of evaluation methodologies, there are three main uh, existing methodologies or, or widespread methodologies. The first one is uh, reusable test collections which is uh, the standard evaluation methodology for making the relative comparison between two systems. Um, yeah, let's just move this. this Sorry for the survey. Let me just move this for you. So, oh, come on. We don't find me. Yeah, I don't know why it doesn't fall. Oh, it's showing up in the screen. Yeah. Okay, but this is okay. Let, let me see. I know. Uh, press more. Uh, hide uh, the banner. This one. And this okay. one. Okay. Okay. Oh, I, yeah. I <laughs> get you. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Um. Okay, so reusable test collections. Um, so uh, it's an offline, it's also called offline test collection, where we have uh, uh, a collection of uh, information needs, uh, a collection of uh, uh, documents or information objects, and uh, some, some uh, labels, run with labels. And uh, this allows to perform uh, repeatable. Uh, experiment, but uh, it has a limited ability to capture the interactions uh, between the system and the user because uh, there is no um, in interaction involved. It's, uh, it's static in nature. The second one is user studies, uh, where uh, uh, real users are recruited to perform some task, uh, typically under uh, a controlled in, in a controlled environment. And this provides the highest fidelity in terms of uh, capturing uh, what how real users interact with the system, but it's uh, expensive to set up and it's not uh, reproducible. Uh, in principle, for uh, each experiment, we would need to recruit a new set of users because there are uh, learning effects and, and, and so on. And the third one is online evaluation, where we are observing real users in an operational setting and we assess system performance by looking at the logs of uh, user behavior. And uh, it enables measuring performance in a in situ uh, setting, and it's scalable, but it's not reproducible. And there's no control over users. So none of these existing methodologies enable comparison of uh, multiple interactive uh, systems using reproducible experiments. The test collection based the Evaluation is static in nature, and when real users are involved, then there is uh, an inherent lack of reproducibility. The second important point is that we want to evaluate the overall effectiveness of a system. And commonly, the way we go about developing systems is that we break it up to smaller components, and then those components can be evaluated uh, individually using offline test collections. And that is very useful to make progress on a specific components. But uh, ultimately, we want to evaluate the system as a whole in which we need to put those the components together and see how users interact with them. So if we want to do that, then we do need to involve the user in some way. And uh, simulated users can provide a solution to uh, conduct controlled and thus reproducible experiments. Now, what is, what is user simulation? Uh, first, uh, we look at it informally, then, uh, then uh, formally. Informally, it's uh, having an intelligent agent that uh, simulates how a real user would uh, interact uh, with the system. Uh, user simulation has many different uses. 
uh, the first one and the one we will be focusing on today is a large scale automatic evaluation. Uh, but it can also be used to gain insights into user behavior, uh, and those insights can inform the design of systems. We can analyze system performance under different uh, conditions and uh, perform these what if studies, uh, measuring the influence of uh, you know, certain uh, uh, behaviors or characteristics on uh, some. Uh, system component or, or overall system performance. And simulation can also be used to generate uh, synthetic data. Um, we will come back to the requirements uh, in a bit, but uh, I really want to uh, put forward that uh, simulation does not need to be perfect. Uh, when our goal is to make uh, relative comparisons between systems, then it's enough if it's uh, able to identify relative system differences. That's, uh, that's our objective. So more formally, uh, user simulation is the process of uh, modeling a user's behavior and decision-making patterns within an interactive system, uh, specifically designed to mimic and predict how a user will act in various interaction contexts or scenarios related to completing a task. So uh, there are a number of configuration variables that influence how users behave. The first one is the task itself. Uh, we need to know what is the task that the user is trying to accomplish. And you can think about uh, you know, when a user interacts with a search engine, they might want to collect uh, as, many, as much relevant information, as many relevant documents as possible, or they just want to find a suitable product to, to purchase. Those are different tasks. Uh, the system itself is a configuration variable. Uh, we need to know what uh, functionality the system has, uh, what uh, the user interface looks like, uh, and uh, what are the different uh, types of actions that can be performed with the system. And we also need information about the user uh, itself, uh, individual characteristics uh, uh, such as age or technical proficiency or interests, uh, or, uh, cognitive styles, those are all part of uh, uh, the user variable. And then given these variables T, S, and U, uh, the goal is to create an agent that can simulate every action that this user U uh, might take when attempting to complete the task with the system. This uh, problem involves developing a computational model, Pi, which uh, predicts uh, the action taken by the user uh, based on the current state. And the state is composed of the task system user, as well as the history of previous interactions uh, between the user and the system. And uh, the, the choice of this model, Pi, is influenced by the nature of the task and the system and the user information. Uh, it can be a simple rule-based model, or it can be a machine learning algorithm. Now, uh, this definition is quite uh, broad in nature, and in this table, you can see some uh, possible uh, instantiations uh, where depending on how the task is uh, defined. The scope of simulation can range from a very specific action, like uh, uh, predicting a rating on a given item, to modeling complex behavior uh, across uh, possibly multiple tasks. Um, so the second row is, for example, uh, when we want to model how a user refines a search queries when uh, uh, trying to find specific information. And in this case, we might have information about the user's initial query, the search history and click behavior, and the actions that uh, we want to simulate are the query formulations and clicks. In case of the last row, it's uh, user seeking assistance with some technical issue using a conversational agent, and the uh, actions are prompts that the user sends to the conversational system. We distinguish between two broad families of approaches, uh, model-based and data-driven. Uh, model-based approaches uh, uh, may be based on uh, rules 
for interpretable probabilistic models. And they are based on some background knowledge about how users uh, behave in certain situations. And data-driven or machine learned approaches uh, utilize observed data and try to learn a model that uh, maximizes the accuracy of, of fitting uh, the model to observe the data. Uh, the first type of approaches, model-based ones, are uh, interpretable. And the second group is generally uh, non-interpretable or, or has limited interpretability. And uh, interpretability is something that we uh, would like to have to make sure that we can uh, test uh, different hypotheses about users and to ensure that the evaluation results are meaningful. And what we mean by interpretability here is that we can vary different configuration parameters and they correspond to how users are expected to behave. So you can think of a configuration parameter like how much patience or persistence a user has. And by adjusting that uh, uh, parameter, we can control the behavior of users. And it's also possible to combine the different uh, types of approaches, especially if we are uh, modeling uh, more uh, complex uh, tasks. As our focus is on system evaluation, it's uh, important that uh, simulators provide reliable and insightful assessments. And the two requirements we have for those are validity and interpretability. Uh, validity means that uh, the simulated users must exhibit behavior that is aligned with uh, what we observe uh, in uh, real, observe from real users, for example, in, in logs. And this includes both uh, high-level strategies, so the different types of patterns that uh, users employ, but also uh, observations on the level of low-level actions, so click patterns uh, and so on. Interpretability is not strictly a requirement, but something that's highly desirable. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we want the simulated behavior to be understood and adjusted through these controllable parameters. Uh, as I also mentioned before, uh, while we want to strive for high validity, uh, creating a perfect user simulator that uh, flawlessly replicates uh, human behavior is uh, likely an AI-complete problem uh, that is uh, on par in difficulty with achieving artificial general intelligence. So that's the ultimate goal, and we hope to make progress towards that goal but we accept imperfections as long as simulation provides useful results. There often also exists a trade-off between validity and interpretability with the data-driven simulators uh, that are trained on large data sets. They can achieve very high predictive accuracy, but they have reduced interpretability. So depending on how we want to use simulation, this is a decision that uh, that's a design decision to be made. And uh, in addition to validity uh, and interpretability, there are other desirable properties that can improve the realism of user simulation. The first one is cognitive plausibility. So the decision-making processes of uh, uh, users should be grounded in models or theories of human cognition, uh, ensuring that these follow how users make decisions and the decisions are not uh, arbitrary. The simulation should also reflect the uh, general user behavior patterns and also exhibit uh, ver variability and occasional outliers. So not all users, uh, there is a, there's a general tendency, but it's also uh, real human uh, behavior to have some unpredictable actions and, and outliers. And uh, users also learn while interacting with the system. So uh, adaptability is something uh, that is desirable as uh, users use the, the system over a longer period of time, they adjust their expectations and behavior accordingly. Uh, it is very important to emphasize that uh, simulation is not meant to replace the other evaluation methodologies, but to complement them. And we see it as a part of this evaluation workflow right in the middle. 
So offline test collections can be used to evaluate specific components in a reproducible way. Uh, human evaluation is uh, costly and non-reproducible. So what user simulation can do in the middle is to be used to compare a large number of uh, system alternatives or options in a reproducible and uh, cost-effective way. And then the most promising uh, system variations should undergo uh, or be subjected to human evaluation. The, the ultimate evaluation is still human evaluation, and that is the that also serves as a validation for the for the simulation results. If we in the end see that the human assessments align with the simulated uh, results, then we know that we can trust the simulator. All right, uh, then I hand it over to Cheng for the second part. Okay, well, uh, thanks, Christian. Um, so now uh, we're going to do a, a brief overview of the research so far on this topic. It's a pretty broad topic. And as we both heard from yesterday's tutorials, the scope is even broader than what we have built here. But broadly speaking, the work so far has been done in three kind of communities. The first is the information retrieval community, which broadly includes recommended systems and also conversational search and recommendation. Second is dialogue systems nowadays, intelligent agents, the intelligent task agents, or conversational AI to help people finish tasks. The third is user modeling, and now this also evolves into uh, understanding uh, social environment, understanding users' behavior uh, in general. So we're going to fairly briefly summarize what we have seen in the work in these areas, mostly as a general kind of overview of all the work, and then later we'll zoom into some of the work in much more detail. So first, in the IR community, people have always cared about users, even since the very beginning of the field, and information retrieval and recommended systems are have also historically been studied together. I think recommended systems were called selective dissemination of information in library science in old days. And so in all these cases, we care about the, the matching of uh, item with a uh, user's interest and the, the user's information need needs to be modeled accurately, but also how users interact with information in general is, is important. So in, in very early days, people did not have digital systems, electronic systems, but they wanted to study information retrieval. So there was simulation, for example, synthetic queries and documents to analyze the fact of changes of documents responding to some queries and the various retrieval strategies. And this is a general characteristic of simulation because when we don't have the real environment to study something, or you cannot do that, then you simulate it. We cannot study. Uh, how people respond to some events, then you kind of uh, simulate that. That's what happened. And people also study the effectiveness of relevance feedback, which is the idea of having users give systems some feedback about whether the search results are relevant or not, which document is good, which document is bad. And the system is supposed to learn from that. In old days, there was no such interactive system. So people simulate that, pretend that the user could say this document is relevant, what would happen. Then in the second wave, which you can see from the timeline was kind of driven by web search. And when search is done by all kinds of people, not librarians, and naturally the user behavior also varies more significantly. And it's even more important to understand the ordinary users so that web search engines can serve them well. That's when we start seeing work like relevance feedback for the study and also query generation simulation of users' queries and, and also further examination of users' behavior in detail, like scanning a document list, examination of the document, clicking on the document, and, and when to stop, it, especially if the user is you know, abandoned search. It's important for search engines to understand why and when. So some specific findings in early studies, people you know, have already emphasized user effort as an important factor because they want to minimize user's effort while 
helping them find the information. That was noticed uh, in many decades ago. And that's why evaluation measures have been trying to reflect the what they think users would appreciate, that measure user perceive, uh, perceive the utility. So, but you can see from the uh, work listed here, in early days, people already thought about the market dimensions of measures of users satisfaction and the performance or the effectiveness of a system from the perspective, not just relevance, or the relevance is the main factor that we're using today, which if you look at research papers, we're just measuring relevance, but efficiency, utility, and user satisfaction and success in general uh, would be important. And from user simulation perspective, that just means we should have a way to easily define these other dimensions issues as well. So simulation provides a methodology for us to think about all these dimensions, as we'll see later. Uh, a couple of very interesting findings associated with these uh, studies. Uh, one is there's no strong correlation between some of the measures, like uh, average precision and real user success. And this phenomenon is what we nowadays know as offline and online uh, difference. When industrial apps study their systems offline, by doing essentially simulation. And when they are using real users in online evaluation, AB test, they discover differences. And this difference largely reflects the problem of user simulation I think, from our perspective. When our simulated users are not accurately reflecting real users, not just as a person, but also um, just not reflecting what they can perceive as useful information in general, so then the measure may not be uh, accurate. However, as uh, Christiane said earlier, uh, imperfect user simulators are still fine for relative comparison. And that, that means we may not be able to say whether this user, or this kind of user will be satisfied with this system result, but we may be able to say one algorithm is better than another algorithm based on our simulation. And just because you know, any incomplete information, any inaccuracies are unlikely correlated with a particular system. They are not going to favor one system. In that sense, the relative comparison may be still uh, useful. So the second community, which is growing and nowadays significantly due to the availability of large language models, is dialogue systems and AI communities have been building those, those systems to help people finish the task, you know, booking a flight ticket or um, interacting with a bank system, et cetera. So they want to have um, a dialogue system. And in this domain, people have uh, started uh, using more formal models to describe the user. Because in this kind of system, a, a user is interacting with a system, the system needs to understand how to optimally serve the user. The optimal algorithm there is the interaction algorithm. So they use the simulation to essentially augment data for the system to learn, so to learn dialogue policy. But from our perspective, a major idea is the market decision process as a general model to model users. In this kind of task, it's natural to think about the states as reflecting progression toward a task. But in case of search, we could think in the same way, but the search task is often not so explicitly defined. And search engines don't generally have an explicit model of a task. For, but for these systems, they're more restricted to a particular task. So it's easier to model this as well. But as a framework, the model of this process as you will hear later, is a general framework that we should be thinking about and um, model any user. Basically model any state of the user in that state of what the user would do in response to some system, uh, system responses. But um, the, the use of user simulation for evaluation has not been really studied, has not been emphasized there. Uh, because of the motivation was not for evaluation. Our tutorial has taken this perspective of evaluation. Because in the future, if you have any intelligent system serving users in an inter interactive way, how do you objectively say one system is better than another, or how do you compare multiple systems in a reproducible way? It seems that there's no other way except for 
simulation. So as systems become increasingly interactive, this kind of simulation-based evaluation may become more important. The third direction is user modeling. And from this perspective, when we simulate the users, we have to define exactly what the user is going to do in any situation interacting with the system. So we give a formal model, give a more precise model of the user. And so there has been a lot of work on user model, and user studies, typically using real users and they observe certain behaviors of users in some system environment. Those findings tend to be scattered. They are not necessarily systematic. systematic. They cannot describe the whole user's kind of behavior in interacting with the system, typically some part. But when we simulate the users, build the simulators, and we generally want to simulate the whole user, we want the whole user model. And also we want the user model to be operational. That means the user model has to be a, a program that can be running on a, a system environment to generate the simulated user actions. And we can also distinguish the descriptive versus formal models. They uh, you know, describe the users in slightly differently. Descriptive models can provide a reasoning and post hoc explaining behind the user behavior. They could describe the user's behaviors. And then you can fit this kind of description to real users to see how well they work. But formal models are what we uh, think of more uh, deeply capturing the mechanism of it's a more um, functional user model that can predict the, what the user would do in certain situations. So certain market decision process based on models would be this kind of formal models that would allow us to predict the behavior. And then we can also uh, study or evaluate whether this behavior is really uh, correct or consistent with real users. Another dimension of applications which are actually more common and is a user model can use the component model to model a larger community of users or social environment. And they can model the uh, community over time. I think uh, I see Hong Ling sitting here and he has done some great work recently by using gauge theory to model what would happen in a recommended system environment with some assumptions about users. Although in that case, the user is simulated uh, for just a few actions but nevertheless, that is a case of a user model. Imagine if we can model a user more so in more so this way, then we can model the whole environment of a recommended system. And over time, we can ask the question, what would happen if the system does certain uses, uses certain strategy? And yesterday's tutorial about the simulation of the the societies and but it's also covering a lot of details about the recent uses of large language models for building simulation agents have covered a lot of applications in this kind of direction where a use uh, they simulate multiple users and then they can examine the behavior of this group of users for the time so this is all uses of uh, the simulation but for our tutorial we have folks on the evaluation aspect as we explained earlier this has become a central issue for all the ai systems we have to be able to accurately say whether a system or whether a particular algorithm has really helped the, you know a user and in what way and so this but these work are all complementary they are all interleaved the, the techniques may be similar and so we'll talk more about this later so to summarize, so far, a lot of specific work has been done in information retrieval community, particularly for search and simulating pretty much all the steps from formulating queries, examining documents, and search strategies, and also uh, variation in user behaviors. For recommended systems, I think some of the studies are applicable as well, because once the user interacts with a ranked list of recommendations, they may be in the same situation as in the search engine. But specifically to study user behavior, user simulation for recommended systems has not been done that much as in search. And uh, some possible reasons may be because there's no standard user interface for a recommended system. And that makes it a, a little bit harder to formulate the problem. Unlike a search engine, you see a list, long list of results and we slip it. 
that makes it an easier study. And uh, the second reason is I think that researchers have paid more attention or left the data sets to study learning hours to improve accuracy. So even when they predict the clicks, the goal is to optimize the recommended system, not so much to see if uh, we can simulate what a user is going to respond to a recommended result. But the two are clearly the, the two sides of the same coin, because if you can predict the, whether a user would click on a result, then surely you can put the results that you think the user would click on on the top or recommend the search results because your algorithm would work very well. And similarly, if you can really simulate, uh, yeah, if, if you can simulate the users, you know, realistically, your algorithm can take advantage of the simulator to improve recommendation. But we just haven't seen simulators to build for recommended systems. That much in search. Um, yeah, so in the direction of conversational assistance, and we have seen groups of work on simulating users, and that has probably also um, due to the emergence of large language models that made it much easier, partly because we also need to evaluate those conversational search conversational recommendations. So when you have an interactive session and you want to and say one conversational system is better than another, has really helped the user, you have to think about the session based values. You have to think about the, I think of this, uh, the simulation perspective of users. We can't just think about one theory. It might clarify you know, what the user means. And so this whole interaction would have to be evaluated. Goes beyond the traditional and relevance, relevance based values. Okay, so that's just some fairly superficial description about the background of some of the most relevant work to the tutorial. Now, this part is about the general framework for using simulation to do evaluation. Essentially, we hope to show you that with this kind of thinking, you can evaluate any system by using simulation. And so we're gonna first talk about some traditional evaluation measures and how they attempted to simulate users from some perspective, but then talk about their limitations. Mostly they are restricted to evaluating ranked list. And then we talk about the general framework where we can examine these existing measures as special cases. And it can help us better understand the, the traditional measures and also understand their limitations. But more importantly, it can allow us to evaluate the interactive system. So we're gonna show one example where well, this kind of framework would allow us to compare two interactive interfaces to assess which one is better. With this kind of evaluation currently cannot be done without doing this kind of simulation. So first is traditional evaluation measures. And I think uh, uh, many of you are already familiar with this. This is a Cranfield evaluation methodology. It's a test collection based strategy that has been widely used in, in many um, empirical studies of Algorithms. And generally speaking, you have a collection of documents, and then you have a set of queries or topics, and then you have relevance judgments typically created by users uh, to tell uh, you which documents should be returned for which query. And then this will be used to then test a, a system, given a system, and you can run the system on the test collection, uh, check how close your results are to the ground truth and then give you a score so that you can typically multiple dimensions of scores like precision, recall, and then you compare uh, systems to this. Now, um, we also see that typically we use multiple measures and there is also a reason for that. Some measures are more intuitive from a user's perspective. It's a meaningful measure that we can interpret. For example, precision as to 10 documents, meaning how many documents on average in top 10 results are relevant. So this measure is meaningful from a user's perspective, 50% means just on average, you will see five relevant documents. That's pretty good from a user perspective. But one weakness of this kind of measure is that it's not sensitive to ranking. So uh, any system that uh, just does different orders of those 10 documents, same 10 documents will have the same precision. And so it's not good for comparing to rank the lists. And for that, we have NDCG average precision, which are more sensitive. 
and it can be, it would be a different number if you switch just the uh, order of one relevant blocking and one now non relevant blocking. So it's good. It's, it's it's very good to tell the small differences between algorithms, and we we want that. But that kind of measures are typically hard to interpret from the user's perspective. So take, for example, average precision. The number is not that easy to interpret. The point of three average precision, what does that mean? That, that's not so intuitive as precision at 10. But from user simulation perspective, we can actually interpret those measures. And it turns out that the average precision, as the name suggests, it actually simulates a set of users, uh, many different users with variable information. It's, that's why it's hard to interpret it. And we, we'll take a look at that in a moment. So from our perspective, these measures are actually user simulation-based measures. And just the, the assumptions have not been stated uh, explicitly. So this is the workflow typically used in the traditional language measure. The user is assumed to first issue a query and sequentially examine a list of items. And we'll always be able to recognize the relevant ones. So the user will click on that one, will gain some kind of utility, and we'll always know how to uh, skip a non relevant one. And so, uh, in reality, of course, those assumptions are not entirely true. But nevertheless, if we make these assumptions, uh, and also make the assumption that user will stop at some budget of effort, of effort at some kind of rank, K, then we will see the current measures are indeed trying to measure, capture the perceived utility and effort from a user's perspective. So this is, and we can see more about this in a moment, and exactly how we interpret that. But um, I think, uh, let's think about the, the evaluation issue in a more general way. I think if you look at the, all the existing measures, they generally are parameterized in the following dimensions, meaning that when you design a measure, you have to consider the following factors. The first is the user's task. What is the user going to do? And is the user you know, doing literature survey, which is a high recall task, meaning that you want to collect as many relevant articles as you must for. Or is the user just checking out what's happening today? So in that case, it could be called a low recall, or high precision task. And all you care about is to see a couple of relevant news articles, then you're done. You don't care about the, you know, collecting all the relevant articles. And why is this important? Because this determines, for example, you know, where you set the K, precision at K. For someone who checks the news, if you set precision at K to 30, that, that's probably not reflecting real use. For, for someone who is doing serious literature review, maybe they could look up to the 30th uh, document in the rank list. So that determines how we define the cutoff, but it also determines uh, the user's patience in browsing the list, et cetera. The second aspect is user's behavior, which is what I just said, how does the user interact with the result? So typically, we make the assumption that user was sequentially browsing. That's why then we give more reward to a relevant document in the top. But if a user is not doing that, sometimes the user you know, will pay attention to the bottom ones, very bottom ones before they give up. Or if in a um, two-dimensional display, well, you nowadays see that. How, how do we model user's interaction? That becomes more challenging, but that determines the utility. Because if the user examines the result horizontally, then you need all the results in that way, not vertically, perhaps. But, and these the individual users may vary also. So it's important to kind of capture users' actual behavior to measure the perceived utility by this particular user. The third aspect is to measure the reward. You know, if given users interact with the results in this way, how much reward could the user get? And reward generally would be based on relevant information, relevant information, the amount of relevant information. And then finally, we need to measure the effort. How much effort uh, would the user have to make in order to get that much relevant information? This uh, was done by assuming each examination of a document is uh, uh, one unit of cost. But people have also started uh, how to consider variable effort when a document is long, for example, it's going to take more effort. So this 
have been considered as well. This can be grouped in the direction of effort, more accurate modeling of effort. But the existing work, when we look at the, these dimensions, they mostly have uh, been restricted to evaluation of a ranked list of results. The browsing behavior, for example, has been studied uh, a lot, but that's still mostly for a ranked list. But we know that uh, today the systems we see have highly interactive interfaces and two-dimensional displays very common on income websites. And so and sometimes there's marking media information. And so we need to model all these aspects from a user's perspective when they interact with more complicated systems. The existing various measures are just not sufficient. And people did make some effort to move beyond a single ranked list to consider a whole session. This is a step toward evaluating the whole session. And there are some ideas like this post. For example, session NDCG measure is just the extended NDCG measure, which is a commonly used measure to compute a, a, a evaluation a number based on variable levels of gain of relevance is pretty general method used, widely used. But this can be extended to consider a session by concatenating all the search results in the session so that you can form a, a single ranked, long ranked list. Then you naturally penalize kind of later relevant documents. So showing the relevant document in the very first uh, interaction is better than showing the same relevant results later. Expected global utility over session is uh, considering uncertainty of the interactions over session, but it's also along this line to try to use individual measures or define the originally on a single reckless to, to apply them for a session. And, and modern users for housing behavior in the session as a path is an uh, elegant idea because this idea basically means the perceived utility all has to do with perceived ranking of all the documents in a session. A user is assumed to interact with many documents. Eventually, to look at the, the interaction, it shows a linear kind of order of those documents. What matters is the, the accuracy of this linear order. So that that's a, a general idea to help us generalize a single rank list to a session. But it's still, as we just said, it's, it's still you know, restricted to rank the list. How can we evaluate the more general interfaces? That question kind of uh, motivates the development of more general simulation-based evaluation methodology. In this case, we can imagine we have a collection of user simulators. Those are going to simulate all kinds of users. And if the simulators are interpretable with parameters, we can vary those parameters. To simulate all kinds of users. We also have a collection of task simulators. In this case, for search, the task could involve a collection of documents and doing a literature survey, let's say, on this literature the article a collection, or doing uh, some other kind of uh, search uh, on a different kind of documents, or a heterogeneous collection of web documents, a large collection, and simulating people's web search. And those are task simulators. And when we have user simulators, task simulators, then we can evaluate the system by running the system to serve the user to finish that task. And in, in this case, we can then record the interaction information of a simulated user with the system. So this will be a sequence of interactions. And then we can look at the interactions and compute the reward and effort. Overall, do we see the user has made a lot of effort without gaining much, or uh, did the user finish the task without making much effort? So everything can be evaluated in, in this whole uh, session of, of interactions. So more formally, if we just use mathematical symbols to say what I just said, we'll have S to denote the system, you a user, I the whole collection of, uh, of interactions of you and system to finish the task T. And if you, you can map this to also the, the formal definition of user simulation that 
uh, Chris Yan talked about earlier. Right? And then we measure the system's performance based on the eye, mainly. We essentially, intuitively, we look at looking at how the users interact with the system to finish the task, and then compute the, the reward and the, the cost. So, so, of course, the reward depends on the, or the user, the system, and the task. And so, these are just a, a mathematical way of saying what I said in words earlier. Now, in general, you can expect that if uh, the user has more interactions, the user will collect more reward, likely will see more random information. But at the same time, there will be more effort, there will be more cost. If we want a single measure of that, then we can summarize multiple dimensions of measures. At that point, we have to be application specific. There will be different trade offs. Sometimes the record is more important. And that means it's when the user is willing to make more effort in total completing the, the whole task or a high record task, a retrieval task. But sometimes the user doesn't really care about the record, so it will be a different trade off. Um, if we want to be more general, uh, especially in user simulation, where the simulated user could be stochastic, then we should consider this uncertainty. So the user's interaction may not be a determin deterministic sequence of actions. The user could have some uncertainty. In that case, we have to consider the expectation of all the uh, sequences. But this is not the only option we could consider the worst case. And sometimes the user worst case of interaction is worse. So if we care about that, we probably should consider that as well. But in general, you can think about the, consider the uncertainty to take expectation. So that's just the very general framework, the mathematical framework. It's not operational, and we can't just use that to define any measure. But we can refine that framework by introducing specific ways to define the interaction, for example, the measure, the reward, then we'll generate the specific measures. So the first step at refinement is to say, well, the reward or cost defined on whole sequence of interactions can be defined as uh, the reward and the cost at each action level. Because after all, a user collects reward by doing each action sequentially. So at every point that you can uh, estimate a reward at that point, Sometimes there's delayed reward, of course. Um, and then similarly, the cost is associated with, with each action. So if we do this decomposition, and then we need to also assume the system is going to um, respond to users action in a particular way. And so there was, you know, there's a work about the interface card model where it's uh, just assume that the, every system will present an interface card to a user in response to every action, whatever the action is. So if the user's action is a query, then the response, the interface card could be a search results page and could have a, another query box so the user could further take action like a search, could click on a link. Depending on what's in the interface, the user can take the further actions. And if you think in this way, pretty much all the interactive systems we are using today could be framed as special cases of presenting the sequentially uh, different interface cards to serve users and the users will take actions uh, that are supported by that interface. So just with this definition, then we can formally refine the interaction sequence as just the sequence of these couples. And here Z just denotes the user's state during this interaction. And if we ignore that, we just no longer uh, carry about the, the dependence or we, we, we don't consider any dependency, therefore not redundancy the information will not matter. But if we consider this kind of Z, then it gives us a way to, to consider the dependency of utility and, and, and also cost. So with this assumption, it's very easy to see then the, uh, the reward and cost to define the uh, original on the whole sequence can be decomposed as simply uh, sum over each action taken in that sequence. Very straightforward. And then the distribution of this reward cost over all the interactions may be considered, as I said earlier, 
And I think that in the case of a real system, it might be actually important to minimize the worst cost. Uh, because uh, you, when the user had a bad experience with the system, and then the user can, can be affected by that and abandon the system. But so this is just still a uh, you know, general refinement. We still don't have any measure here. Because... But now if we think about the very specific cases, uh, then we'll see easily see the existing measures can in fact be regarded as a very naive user simulator. And then we can see exactly what the assumptions they have made about our users. So the task, looking at the existing measures in this framework, and we can see the task is to find the all random documents. Typically, we care about the all random documents. We call it quite uh, important. In fact, the average position, for example, generally rewards a high recall system because any missing documents will be regarded as zero precision at those points. So it's a it, you know, clearly recall is generally considered. And that was because historically, the search problem was to serve scholars and scholars want to find new literature articles. They generally care about the recall. And then later intelligence analysts are uh, users and they care about the high recall as well. So, but then in web search, a lot of users don't really care about the high recall. So there's certainly some, some difference. The interface card generally can be defined as presenting a document each time. So it's a sequence of documents presented to the user. The system's optimizes is to rank those documents, but from an uh, evaluation perspective, the task is to evaluate a ranked list. A user simulator is defined as actions are restricted to clicking a document, skip a document, essentially examining a document, or skipping one, or stop. These are the actions we consider. And we also assume user always clicks on a random document and always skips a non-random one. Note that in reality, it's not true. We users often don't recognize a random document. They might miss one. But more often, they thought the snippet looks relevant. But when you click on it, they only find that document is after all not relevant. So we, we, we did not consider those variations of this real user characteristics. And also the stopping criteria is stop when the effort or, or, or the cost reaches a budget. That's when we use a K, we really, you know, a cutoff to define the measure. And that can be assumed as the budget that user has used. The reward we can have, think about the one for a relevant document, zero for non relevant document, no gain. And so the cumulative reward would be just a count of relevant documents. It's, and the cost is also one for examining a document. And so in this case, then cumulated cost would be the number of documents you examine. But as I said earlier, there are, of course, improved measures later on top of this. And this is just to show that the base measures can be easily regarded as simulated users. Of course, improved, uh, for example, effort would mean that the cost would depend on the length of document. Or multi-level relevance would mean the reward would also have to reflect the multiple levels of relevance in the case of computing gain. But the idea is very similar here. And we can assume the user state in the in the sequence to just uh, um, to, to um, capture the cumulative reward and the cost. Now, although this is a simple variable here, it, it still allows us to, to consider the, you know, the dependency. So for example, as you already accumulate a lot of reward, any further reward may be diminishing return, so it may not be worth that much. But the cost sometimes also as dependency. If you have already reached uh, some point and that extra cost might uh, just turn it off. So there's some dependency here that could be captured. It's a just a simple case of this kind of uh, decision process that you will hear later. So with that, then we um, we we can rigorously define precision as just the reward to cost, the ratio of reward to cost. And how many relevant documents you have accumulated and when you examine this many documents 
incurring that much cost. Recall is a measurement of task completion. So among all the relevant documents, how many have you got? You know, what's your progress toward the completion of the task? Now, the, I think there are, if you look at the, the, these measures I mean, as user simulators, there are some, some, some interpretations that we can do, but also some limitations. Right? So if, for example, precision at the K equal that. Now, we, here we assume the user always examines K documents. This is not necessarily true, and especially if it's a case of 10, and in question answering, maybe the user, uh, there is only one kind of relevant answer, and then even the perfect system will not get perfect precision at the 10, just because there aren't 10 relevant documents. So the, the assumption here is, uh, is questionable in that if you are finding an answer, you know there's only one answer, then you stop. Once once you see the answer, there's no need to go further. I mean, don't need to exhaust to pay. And but of course there are other measures like mean with correct or things like that. But the point is when we examine these measures rigorously from user simulation perspective, we'll be able to easily see some of the assumptions. And those assumptions can then be examined to see if they are valid or not. So we need to change that. Now, average precision is harder to interpret, but we can also interpret this as modeling a set of users. And each user has a different number of recall needs. So they have variable recall needs. And that's why we, uh, you know, the simulated user might stop at the first relevant document, the second and the third, etc. These are different users, and we are taking an average of that. So from user simulation perspective, average precision is simulating the average performance over all these different users. And that's why it's sensitive to the rank of this uh, position, right? Because we are considering all kinds of users. If a user examines 10 documents, then it doesn't matter whether the, you know, the first two are moved down a little bit. But if a user only examines the top three and then only wants to see one document, that would make a difference. So um, yeah, but finally, I think we just want to show this framework can be used to evaluate a more sophisticated interface that goes beyond the rank list. And um, how am I doing in terms of time? Me too. Okay, so um, so let me uh, highlight some of the ideas and the results that I'm not gonna go into the detail. Basically, the problem here is to compare two interfaces. One is a kind of a, a static interface that can adapt it's displayed to screen size. And another is uh, automatically generated interface using an interface card model that can dynamically adapt the interface. The task here is to show the results to a user so that the user can browse into an interesting news article. And so maybe switch directly to the picture to allow you to see what it looks like. So. But when the screen is large, you can have some tags for browsing and then also show direct the content. But when the screen is small, you probably don't want to show the, the, the content directly unless you are absolutely sure. So the optimal interface will depend on at least two factors. One is your confidence in the user's need. If you are absolutely sure to minimize the user's effort, just display the information directly. Uh, but if you're not sure, it's better to display a tag list to allow user to explore a rank list. The other factor is the screen size, because if the screen is large, like a laptop, I can use half of that to display the results directly, but the other half can still be used to allow you to navigate. But if it's a small cell phone, then if you display the content, there's no way for the user to explore. So you have to be absolutely sure. So the, this screen size does also matters. Now, the hypothesis here is that the uh, algorithm-based uh, dynamic interface design is better than the static adaptive interface. We still have adaptive interface, we, but we just uh, let the user switch between different layouts as needed. And 
So in the experiment, we use the simulation phase uh, users to evaluate the two interfaces. And then we found that the, the, this interface card model has consistently lower interaction cost than the standard interface. So the overall measure is how many clicks do you have to make in order to reach the target article that you're interested in? We show this article to the user at the beginning and I ask you to find that article. So the cost is the larger the cost is the worst performance is. And we see here that also for small screen, the, the gain is, is more. And we also did some that real user experiment. The point is to see if the simulation based conclusion is reliable. And what if we do real user experiments? And then we see that the real user experiment also give us similar results. Uh, using a simulated model, we also can estimate those model parameters. So these, these parameters are probability of scrolling down. And so this is an example of using a user simulator, a formal user simulator to analyze users. Because here it shows that the probability of scrolling down um, in some cases is smaller. And that just means the users you know, are not used to using that picture or they, for some reason they don't need to use that. Okay, so to summarize this um, part, we just present a general framework where the idea is to simulate the task, to simulate the users. Ideally, we have interpretable user simulators that can be varied, and then just test the system using the simulator environment, collect the interaction sequences, define a reward and cost, and then make all kinds of measures to consider the trade off. And we showed that the traditional models can be, uh, measures can be all analyzed in this way. The benefit is to articulate, to make it explicit the assumptions that made so that they can better understand them or improve them as needed. And then finally, we also showed that the framework could be used to compare two interfaces that would otherwise be hard to evaluate. So current factor. Note that this is a reproducible experiment. So if you have another interface, you know, we can use the same method to evaluate your system to see if you, the system gives better performance. So I think I should stop, probably use more time than I should have. And Christian is going to take over, start talking about the, how to build a simulator, start a high level human decision uh, making framework. Yes. So we mentioned in the introduction that uh, cognitive uh, plausibility is a desirable property. And what it means is that we would like these uh, simulators to be grounded in uh, theories of uh, human behavior and not just uh, you know, make arbitrary decisions. So in this part, I will very briefly review some theories that, that are relevant to building user simulators. Uh, so these are the different categories that we will cover, but I just want to provide some pointers here. So we'll not go into into details. Uh, and cognitive models focus on the cognitive processes uh, underlying the information seeking activity. And yeah. uh, one such model is uh, Batkin's uh, ask hypothesis. And it states that an uh, information need arises from a recognized anomaly in the user's state of knowledge concerning some topic or situation. And in general, the user is unable to specify precisely what is needed to resolve that anomaly. So that basically explains why users search for information because there is some gap in their knowledge. And it also says that users don't exactly know how to express that gap. And this uh, uh, is from 1982, uh, but already back then, uh, the idea was to uh, have uh, some intermediary that, uh, facilitates a dialogue between the user and, uh, uh, and uh, the system. So that, that is a kind of a, a human playing the role of a conversational agent. Another uh, cognitive model is the information seeking and the retrieval research framework by Inversion and Yarpelin. And it's a detailed description of uh, the different processes, both from the user and the system perspectives that are part of uh, this information seeking and, and retrieval process. And uh, as you see, it, it maps out these uh, 
different uh, components and focuses on the interactions between them. Uh, this is uh, useful in terms of seeing what the, the connections and interdependencies are, but uh, it's also a model that is a, a very high level of abstraction, uh, but it can still inform the, the design of uh, simulators. Uh, then we move on to process models, which uh, represent the different stages and activities that take place during the search process. Uh, there are several such models. One is by Fultau, uh, which has six stages. So it uh, starts with the recognition that there is a need for information and then uh, the selection of uh, the topic and the approach then some exploration to, to gain further understanding, then uh, formulation where uh, a focused perspective on the topic emerges, then collection of information, and then presentation at the last step. And uh, you notice this is, uh, this is something for more complex information needs. So if you just want to check the weather for tomorrow, then you don't need all these processes. But if you want to learn, uh, you, you want to conduct a literature survey, for example, about a topic that you are still just learning about, then it might involve these stages. Another uh, such process model is by Marcionini, where they have uh, eight sub-processes, and these uh, don't necessarily follow each other in a sequential order, like in the previous model, and they can also develop at different rates. Uh, there are three main classes, uh, the first one is understanding uh, the, the, the information space, and that's mainly a mental activity. And then uh, the other two are planning and execution and evaluation and, and use. Uh, next, there are strategic models, and these models uh, describe uh, tactics or high-level strategies that users employ when searching for information. And these typically use analogies from the physical world. One such model is the barrier picking model by Bates. And uh, it considers that information seeking is analogous to how foragers look for food. And uh, it means that information is often not found uh, uh, at a single place, but as a as uh, the searcher finds uh, information, uh, that uh, it will give them some new ideas and directions to follow. So as you see, this is not a straight path from A to B, but uh, rather an exploration where at each point when they encounter documents that might give them new ideas and information as to what, uh, how to refine queries and, and where to look for additional information. Uh, the other strategic model is information foraging theory, and uh, that uh, is a theory on how animals uh, maximize uh, fitness when they search for food. So they want to gain the most uh, energy at the lowest cost. And, and you, you can think of uh, it as uh, people want to find information using the least effort. So uh, animals search for food in patches and uh, they start uh, you know consuming the food and at some point they they move uh, move on and there is uh, not enough food left and uh, when selecting the next patch uh, there is this uh, notion of scent which gives an indication of how promising that that patch is so you could think of this as uh, these patches as the search engine result pages, SERPs, and uh, by just looking at the SERP, uh, the searcher might get some idea of how valuable this will be, how much time they uh, want to spend on it, and sometimes they can abandon the SERP immediately if it doesn't look promising and, and issue a new query, or stay on it and examine the results uh, at the, the lower depth if it's promising. Uh, so that was mostly about search. There are also uh, models for uh, choice and decision making in recommender systems. And one uh, well-known model in this space is the uh, SPECT model, 
which uh, describes six human choice patterns, so how people generally make choices from uh, a list of options. Uh, the first one is based on attributes. So if options can be described in terms of attributes, then some are more might be more important than others. So if you're looking for a movie, then you might uh, uh, you know, prefer certain genres or movies from, with uh, certain actors or from a certain director. The second one is consequence based choice. When uh, you consider the consequences, uh, for example, when you want to purchase uh, a car or electronic equipment, you might consider guarantee or service cost as a consequence of that choice. The third one is based on experience. So if you had a previous experience that influences uh, whether you will choose that item again or not. Uh, people also influenced by the choices of others, that socially based choice, uh, especially in an organizational setting, there might be organization policies which dictate what choices you can make or not, whether you can fly to dub 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 on the business class or you are forced to choose economy, that's a policy based choice often. And uh, in some cases, you just don't know. If you go to a restaurant where uh, you cannot read the menu, uh, you might just uh, you know, take a random choice and then remember uh, uh, next time if you want to repeat the choice or not. All right, so these are all uh, you know, the theories. Uh, and um, now we, we move on to how can we model these things mathematically? And one framework that we are using uh, to, to unify uh, these different actions is the Markov decision process. Uh, an MDP can formally be described as a finite uh, state space, a finite action set, a set of transition probabilities and the reward function. At any given point in time, the agent is in a given state and by executing an action, they transition into a new state according to the uh, transition probability and they receive some reward. And uh, the Markov property here ensures that this transition depends only on the current state and this uh, simplifies modeling and reduces computational complexity. So uh, MDPs are uh, uh, used in, in uh, many different uh, settings. One, one textbook example is the traveling salesman's problem where the salesman is an agent and uh, they find, need to find the, the, the route that uh, optimizes the overall uh, cost. Uh, and then the, the different routes that are available are the different actions that can be taken. Uh, the rewards are the costs of this, taking a specific route. And then the goal is to optimize the, the overall cost. Uh, when we want to use MDPs for simulation, then uh, the state uh, needs to capture the high level uh, state in the information seeking process, as well as the user's uh, mental and cognitive state. Uh, so what is the goal? Uh, what are the preferences? Uh, what are the emotional states of the user and so on? Actions can be explicit, like uh, clicking or typing a query, or can be uh, implicit, like uh, scanning the result list where uh, we, we cannot directly observe unless we have uh, uh, some sp uh, special device uh, which uh, uh, result the user is currently looking at. Uh, if we consider the explicit states and actions, then uh, the state transitions are, are straightforward. The user uh, issues a query and then they enter into a new state. Uh, the reward and cost, uh, they capture the, the user's uh, objective of uh, information seeking and the effort that they uh, must make in order to achieve that goal. And the policy is uh, how the user chooses what action to perform in each state. That's what we want to uh, simulate. Uh, MDPs are often, uh, most often used in, in a reinforcement learning setting. So it might be useful to, to contrast uh, the reinforcement learning setting and, and user simulation. In RL, uh, the main goal is to find an optimal policy that maximizes the expected uh, reward over time. And designing an effective reward function is crucial for that. 
the transition probabilities are often observed from the external environment. In user simulation, uh, the policy in an ideal case is based on some explicit model of user behavior. So we know how the user is supposed to behave in a probabilistic way, but still the user is uh, um, uh, following some, some workflow. And uh, the, this behavior must be controllable by the system designer. Uh, the reward function is typically used to capture the costs and the rewards. And the transition probabilities are modeled explicitly based on the, this user model. All right, so with this theory in mind, now we really move on to discussing how to simulate specific actions. And we will discuss it in, in two main sections. The first one will be in the context of search and recommender systems, and the second one will be in the context of conversational assistance. Uh, these are the, the different steps. Uh, until the break, we just plan to go to the first two, so don't don't worry. Uh, soon uh, be going on a on a small break. Um, so you have seen this uh, workflow before. This is a uh, this might be seen as a user model, a very naive user model, uh, which is highly abstracted, where we assume that uh, once the user issues a query and get, uh, gets a ranked list of results, they will always examine uh, results up to a fixed uh, rank position K. And uh, as you have already seen in the, in the previous parts, uh, many evaluation measures are based on the simplified model of user behavior so this is this is useful but at the same time this is clearly a simplification and the, the goal with all these models is to you know uh, abstract away unnecessary complications but at the same time we would like these to be realistic so also capture the 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 parts that are uh, important elements of human behavior so a more realistic uh, search workflow uh, would be something like this. Uh, the user, uh, once uh, they receive the rank list of uh, documents, they examine snippets one by one. And uh, for each snippet, so first of all, here uh, it's on the level of items. And it assumes that the, the user, basically if, if items are documents, then the user examines each document. That's not how it works in practice. Uh, you get some snippet from the document, and then the user can decide based on the snippet if they find it attractive. If yes, they can read the document, and then they can decide if the document was relevant or not. And after that, they can decide to continue searching or not. And some snippets will be skipped and will not be examined at all. Uh, and even more realistic workflow is the complex searcher model, where uh, it starts with what is called topic examination. To think about it as the overall information need, the user wants to find out about uh, some topic. And then there is a process of querying. Uh, the user can come up with possible queries, and then they decide which query to issue. Once they issue a query, they will first look at the search engine result page. And if it appears useful, then they can start examining the documents. If it doesn't appear useful, then they either issue a different query or they stop searching altogether. And then uh, uh, when uh, they examine uh, the search engine result page, there are different possible stopping points. We will come back to that. Uh, we can think of similar workflows for uh, recommender systems. So, uh, Again, we can assume that there is some preview of an item, for example, a uh, um, movie thumbnail or an item thumbnail. And based on that, the user can decide if they want to click on the item. And uh, in recommender systems, it's also typical to be able to leave feedback, thumbs up or uh, some star ratings. The user can decide to leave feedback or not. And then they keep examining items. And again, this assumes uh, a single ranked list of items. Uh, today, it's more common to have these uh, carousel-based interfaces. So think of uh, e-commerce or, or uh, 
especially on on uh, uh, video platforms where you have these different rows with the items. So then this model assumes that the user will first decide if they want to look at items in that row and uh, examine items sequentially within a row and move on to the next row or stop uh, uh, browsing. All right, um, we are at time. So to, in order to keep in the schedule, we might stop here and then uh, we continue with the querying part after the break. All right, uh, welcome back. Uh, hopefully the sound is fixed. Uh, so we continue with the- uh, Have we resumed the recording? Yes, yes, the okay. uh, recording is resumed. Uh, continue with the simulation of queries. Uh, when we talk about uh, querying, it's important to consider uh, the different user goals that might be behind uh, the query. One is to, find an item that the user knows is there. That's typical of a case where uh, you have seen an email before or you have seen a document and you're trying to recall terms to that help you refine that document. And the other is when you want to find information about uh, a topic that's uh, ad hoc search and you don't necessarily know the, the query terms. Um, in the book, we cover many different query generation approaches. Here, I'm just going to highlight one from, uh, from each category. Uh, the first one is uh, a case of uh, known item search. And in this case, we want to generate both uh, queries and documents. Uh, and uh, uh, this, is, this is the algorithm proposed by Ozzy Parvi et al. The idea is that uh, we pick randomly uh, or with some probability a document from the collection, and we assume that this is the document that the user wants, the user is looking for. And then uh, we pick the length of the query according to some distribution, and we repeatedly sample terms from that document, and that will be the, the simulated query. The advantage of this approach is that it gives us a collection of uh, document query pairs. So it also gives us uh, relevant judgments in a way. There will be one relevant document for that query and all other documents will be non-relevant. Uh, and of course, that's a simplification, but uh, on the other hand, this is a, a cheap way to create an entire test collection automatically. Now, in, in uh, many cases, uh, people don't uh, have a specific document that they want to find, but they just, they're just looking for relevant information about a given topic. And those simulation works uh, often are based on these uh, track topic definitions that looks uh, something like this. Uh, there, is a, there is a title which uh, corresponds to a keyword query, and then there is a more elaborate the description and then also a narrative that uh, explains uh, what are documents that the user would find relevant and non-relevant. So uh, these uh, simulators typically sample terms from these topic descriptions to simulate how users would formulate queries. Um, one line of work uh, focuses on the process of query reformulation. And in this case, there are different reformulation strategies identified, which uh, are based on uh, observed uh, real life behavior. Uh, so it could be, for example, that uh, it's a single term query and uh, in each iteration, the query term is changed, or it can be a two or three term query and one of the query terms is, uh, is changed. Uh, finally, uh, 
a more realistic uh, query generation approach is uh, where it uh, uh, conditions the query terms on the documents that the user encounters during the search. So uh, there is a language model from which query terms are sampled, and that language model is updated continuously based on the results that uh, the user has seen. All right, so then we move on to the, the next action, and that's uh, scanning behavior. Uh, scanning is a little bit uh, tricky because it's not uh, uh, an explicit action that can be observed. It's uh, the clicks that can be observed. So therefore, scanning and clicking are often modeled together. But if we focus uh, strictly on, on the, the scanning part, then it's concerned with how the user processes the result in the ranked list that is presented to them. And uh, the simplest case, it's assumed that it's a single list uh, that is examined uh, uh, sequentially. Uh, the cascade model that assumes that uh, the user will examine each result and decide if it's relevant uh, or not. And uh, at some point, they will click. And uh, at that point, they will stop examining the additional results. And uh, it means that the user would not return to the to the list after they uh, have clicked on the result. The second model, the user browsing model, um, uh, allows the user to return to uh, the scanning. And it further breaks it to two decisions. One is uh, whether the user examines the snippet at all, and uh, independently of it, whether they find that uh, snippet attractive. Now, uh, these models assume uh, the traditional 10 blue links layout. That's the one that you see in the top left corner. And uh, most modern uh, search engine result pages have uh, more complex uh, layouts where this top draw uh, traversal assumption is is no longer uh, necessarily it doesn't hold so uh, in product search uh, results are often arranged in a grid in a video recommendation there are these carousels uh, which can also be scrolled independently and then uh, uh, there are also ads often which uh, also in the different parts of the page which can distract the flow. Uh, so um, scanning is one of those uh, elements where a uh, data-driven model might be uh, more accurate than, than these uh, model-based approaches that assume a certain user behavior. OK, and then I hand over to Chang for uh, uh, simulating clicks part. Yeah, thanks, Christian. Now, so after you examine the result, a user will generally I need to decide whether uh, whether the document was examining. So the user will click on a document, try to see the full content. Now, in, in this case, we of course. Um, only decide whether the user will click on the document after the user has had an opportunity to examine the document. And so this happens after scanning. But in the existing studies, the two are often integrated together, meaning that we don't necessarily study the detailed behavior of the user when clicking. Uh, perhaps the most interesting issue here is that the most uh, in, in most existing work, we have made this you know, perfect uh, snippet assumption. And that is in, when we evaluate the results, we assume the user will be able to recognize a relevant document and as well as a non relevant document. But in reality, of course, this is affected by the quality of snippet. If the snippet is misleading and we are often tricked to click on the document, that's not relevant. And so but I, 
funded because there's not that much information or data available to study snippets. But maybe for some reason, maybe people just ignore this issue. We're okay with this assumption. We haven't seen a lot of work on you know, assessing relevant space on snippet. Uh, Nori, could you look at your expert on evaluation? Have you seen some work on studying the impact of snippet on people's evaluation? Or Yeah, I guess search engine the results are not available, but clearly that's part of the the system interface and it has to be evaluated. And and that could be the reason why Google and Bing are still showing the results as if before there's no improvement to the, the snippet part. Anyway, so another trade-off that we have to consider is whether the click model can be parameterized with meaningful parameters so that we can we can vary it so that we can model different users in a realistic way. And here there will be trade-offs between some kind of models that are interpretable, but perhaps overly simplified. But it's easy to generalize such a model and to vary such a model to simulate the different behaviors. At the other extreme is models that are using deep learning and using machine learning using a lot of features that may be very accurate in predicting the clicks but they cannot be uh, varied because the parameters in such machine learning models are optimized we cannot manually tune any parameter to, to make the user more patient for example to simulate their behavior eventually the two of course will Converge, I think, and when we have more interpretable machine learning models for these large language models. So, we want to use this opportunity to also show a specific example of the Markov decision process in simulating users. And in general, we'll be considering different states a user could be in. So, in this case, the state that user is in is the context of seeing a snippet and deciding whether to click. And the what we need to do computationally is to compute the policy. At this point, the policy will determine the user's action. There could be two actions. One is not clicking, one is clicking. So the mathematically, we just want to compute this policy function based on the context. So the context could include a lot of information, definitely the user's current query and also the snippet itself, the whole ranked list of the results and other user information about the user, different kind of user background might affect the user's behavior and historical context information. So all the information should be used to build a clicker model. Now, I want to mention an overly simplified case as a way to explain the, the, the connection with the evaluation measure like NPCP. And so, in this um, simple model, we just assume the probability of clicking a result, on a result has nothing to do with the content there, but has to do with the position. So, if the position is higher, it's ranked on the top of the user, then when we have a high probability to click on it, and this is called also position bias. And people are known to just favor results on the top, so they will click on those results more often. If we do that, and then we can just simplify the context that we are considering the state that we, we consider in the bulk of this process. And one specific example is if we define the probability of clicking a document at position i is uh, equal to one over log of i plus one, then you know, the NPCG, the evaluation measure, can be then regarded as using this kind of user model to compute uh, the expected uh, gain. Because the higher the probability of clicking on that result, and then the more contribution the relevance at this position is to the overall utility. So this is precisely what NPCG is, is doing. So this is another example of interpreting a, a existing measure in the simulation framework where we clearly see the coefficient in NPCG 
could be interpreted as a more probability of clicking on a document. So it's a click model. Essentially, NDCG has implicitly used uh, this position-based click model. Okay. It makes sense, but of course, we know we can improve it. Imagine we could improve this, then NDCG could be improved by using a more realistic click model. Uh, the other thing that's worth mentioning is to accurately model the click behavior, we really need to examine the interaction of the scanning and, and the click and to interpret what the user is doing or interpreting the, the click throughs for further learning from the user interaction. And this table just showed all these combinations. The main point is if the user has not been exposed to the result and even if the user doesn't click on it, we cannot just assume the user is not interested in that. And similarly, if a user has already seen this, but skip it, then we're sure the user is not interested in that. And this kind of information can be also useful for training a user simulator. If you want to train a simulator to simulate this user, we have to interpret the user's click throughs accurately in order to to train a, a simulator. And finally, just some brief discussion about the use of these click models in simulation of users. And I just already mentioned the trade off here. And in, in reality, we have to decide what to use. And so that's when we would face a, a, the, the trade off. And so the I think it depends on our purpose. And if we, the, if the evaluation you know, requires some click models to feed, to give feedback documents to a machine learning model for ranking, let's say, then maybe this kind of position based uh, click throughs would be also okay. And in terms of you know, comparing two ranking algorithms. But if we are going to compare two interfaces with maybe different snippets, clearly this click model has to use the snippet information, has to be more sophisticated. It cannot be just based on the, the position. Another factor that we'll have to consider in simulating the click model is a user's knowledge background. This has to do with how to model the user's knowledge and you know the also the updating of knowledge. And you have seen in the query, one of the query formulation methods that we talked, talked about earlier, and then the user's knowledge state is updated after the user has interacted with some results that the user has learned from the results. So the, there's some dependency of the click model and the user's learning over the search session. In terms of specific models, and our book has covered a lot of those models, and particularly there's also an excellent reference here, just um, here, uh, Chaplin um, and others, 2015. It's a comprehensive book with a lot of specific models, and where we can see the current click models have examined all kinds of interactions of scanning and uh, uh, continuation and stopping and all these uh, behavior aspects related to the clicking. The knowledge update is also addressed in the book. For recommended systems, from what we have seen so far, most models are trying to optimize prediction accuracy of click models for the purpose of improving a recommended system, not so much to simulate the user. But there has been one line of work that's interesting just based on choice models. Those are interpretable models of clicking. For example, you know, clicking based on popularity or based on the freshness of information, the age of information, or the rating. And these are interpretable kind of click models. And in, in this case, the authors have used these simulators to also study the overall behavior of a recommended system interacting with different kinds of users. They use these models to analyze real user behavior as well. So that's a, some um, interesting rhythm work in the recommended system line. Uh, has used more interpretable models. 
And finally, the reason the study on using large language models to make a relevance judgments may be regarded as a way to simulate the user's uh, click through as well. It's a non interpretable way we're using these large language models, but those models are known to be very similar to humans. So, you know, it, it, I think it's a step forward in modeling clicks. We can certainly prompt a large language model by showing this snippet and do you think this user would click? And these large language models now would be able to do that. Before, you know, it was not that easy to build such a model. Okay, next, so after people, a uh, user clicks on the document, the user general will then process the document. So in this case, the user will consider so the utility and uh, uh, the effort and when the user spends it for hours. Document with the user continue and certainly there's uh, a factor of effort involved and the, and the utility gain. Yeah. Here there's some work on uh, modeling the wear time as a way to model the effort. And so this is a descriptive uh, user model here. They just uh, you know, assume that the user would have some kind of effort, some um, would, would use some kind of time to uh, process document proportional to the lens. It's reasonable and there's some and the parameter here that could be empirically fit based on users' actions. But this is a step forward in modeling the effort in um, more detail. Generally speaking, utility is based on relevance. So that's uh, the relevance could be at, at different uh, levels. And I think uh, a user would be able to learn from reading a document, just like a learning from the whole session, ideally that should be also modeled. And because once the user knows more, then user will be able to recognize, let's say, click through um, in the next uh, interaction. So they may recognize some words in snippet that they could not recognize before. So processing document will generate that kind of impact. And of course, overall, if you think about the effort and the utility, the, Relevancy is only part of that. Then there would be could be other uh, utility of the document. We generally haven't really seen as much study of, of that, but clearly it's also important to accurate the model and user the area where the user reads through the whole document, how much impact the document has on the user. And then finally, it's the simulation of stopping behavior because eventually the user will stop and there could be multiple reasons for stop. And this flow just showed that there are at least uh, three different points at different uh, position, uh, in different contexts where a user could um, decide to stop. Sometimes the user has found the information after examining the result, the user happily stopped. That means that the decision factor is the user immediately needed to satisfy. Sometimes it's because the user decided that there's no hope, so the user abandoned the search. And, and sometimes the, the stop is in the middle of search. Let's say when the user examined the result for one query, at some point the user stopped. Now that stopping action should be interpreted as potentially formulate another query, especially if the user did formulate another query. That stop uh, on the surface is stop, but it's actually a decision between going further on the rank list versus formulating another query. Now, for all such decisions, in general, we need to model the user's utility, the gain, and effort. If going down further, the user does not make that much effort, just to slow down. But the gain may be less. So if the user estimates that the precision at that point is low, there's no hope of gaining a lot. Even a little effort to slow down more will, will not be worthwhile. So they will decide to reform the query. But another you know, factor is how easy it is to reform the query. Initially, the user may be easy to formulate another query. But after formulating the query a few times, if the user you know, could not find the information, the user may have no choice but to slow down and read more results 
because the user's effort in formulating another potentially effective query is going to be high, that there will be more effort. And when there's more effort for the alternative, the user will stay in the browser. So all these need to be considered in following the user. And that, you can see that depends on the user's cognitive state, and that needs to be updated all the time. It depends on the task. If it's an important task, the user can't afford missing information, then the user will tend to make more effort. If it's not such an important goal, maybe the user will just give up. So there are user studies that have been done to try to understand why people decide to stop. And they found that users do not apply predetermined criteria, but rather based stop decisions on what they feel at that time, if the results are good enough and there's no fixed budget or quota of red document, they just stop. This is a kind of very complicated it's a human decision process. And there are more than my favorite metadata. There are a lot of other factors could affect the user's decision and whether they are in a rush of doing something or all those factors would, would affect them. Include time constraints, diminishing returns of further information seeking, and increasing redundancy on information capital. And different heuristic rules will quantitatively characterize the sense of good enough and that. That's based on those user studies. Satisfaction or search of frustration or satisfaction or frustration and or time based. And these are all realistic factors and they can all be used as interpretable models for deciding when to stop. So if a user simulator can use this criteria, then the user simulator, we have some parameters that we can control. Those are interpretable parameters we can simulate the different uh, scenarios of users, the same user or different kinds of users. And finally, in this part, we want to touch the important issue of validating simulators. Because if we are going to use the simulators with valid systems, we want to make sure that these simulators are reliable. We have already touched this issue earlier. And imperfect simulators may be still fine for relative comparisons. But just the, if you want to infer real users in terms of the utility of a search engine, if the simulator is not accurate, then we cannot actually estimate its real world impact on real users. So there are different criteria for this. In general, we want this to be close to a real user, but how do we define close? We can define it from different perspectives. And also we are using these simulators for different purposes. Maybe what we care about is whether the simulator is good enough for our goal, for our embarrassment. So for example, here are some criteria that people have studied. Would the simulated user need to simulate retrieve or performance to what is obtained from real users? Now you can see this kind of criteria will help us assess a, a retrieval systems actual utility because if the performance of similar data queries is comparable to the performance of real user queries, then the, the performance we see of the system using simulated users will be kind of matching real world performance. So they, they could inform us whether a system can be deployed if it has good performance. So this is one kind of criteria. Uh, another criteria would a simulated user produce data that matches the characteristics of real user data. But this kind of criteria may be appropriate uh, for data augmentation. If we are using simulated to gener generate additional data for training machine learning algorithms, if data are distributed in similar ways uh, to real user data, that's, that's helpful. We care about this more than whether their performance is similar to real queries uh, of, of users. And finally, if we want to compare two systems by using a simulator, what we care about is if the conclusion we draw by using some simulators when comparing two systems would be consistent with what we would conclude when we use real users to compare that. So in this case, we care about, again, something else. And, and in this line, there has been some work on uh, validating these simulated one idea is to build a tester. A tester is kind of um, 
a setup of two systems that are known to have some order in terms of their performance, or one system is expected to be worse than the other. This was by design, for example, make some component worse, and then we should expect the one system is better. Now, in this case, we can test the user simulator by checking whether uh, the evaluation results based on that the simulated user would be consistent with the pattern we expect them. Namely, it's going to conclude in the same way as we designed. If so, then this user simulator behaves reasonable and we can trust it. If the user give, simulation gives us a different result, then this user simulator can be assumed to be unreliable. But then the testers themselves can have variable degree of reliability. So there's been some algorithm that would try to assign a score for the test at the same time, then, then you can have algorithm to iteratively update the reliability estimate for user simulators and the reliability score for the testers. So a user simulator passes many high reliability testers. That gives this user simulator a higher degree of reliability. And similarly, if the tester could distinguish in high reliability user simulators from others, then this tester could be regarded as reliable. It's passed by, by all or most reliable user simulators. So this is uh, about the validation. Next, I think I turn this to uh, Christina to continue the discussion of simulation interactions with conversational agents. Yes, uh, so in this part, we will look at a uh, different type of uh, information access systems. And uh, um, before uh, uh, I start, it's uh, good to situate it uh, a little bit. So there are, uh, broadly speaking, two main types of conversational AI systems. One is goal-driven or task-oriented, which aim to assist users to complete some specific task. Uh, this is what we will be focusing on. There are also non-goal-driven uh, systems, also known as chatbots, uh, which aim to carry on an extended conversation. And uh, one might say that the, the purpose is entertainment. So that's also a goal in, in some way. But uh, we focus more on systems which have uh, um, more measurable goal, and specifically that the goal is to uh, access uh, information, so satisfy some information need through a conversation. And this includes the tasks of a search recommendation, question answering, with the uh, boundaries often blurred uh, between them. Um, we can contrast the uh, conversation information access with traditional search and recommendation. And uh, the first thing is that uh, the, the user interface is quite uh, different. There is only uh, in a chat-based interface uh, a user prompt, and all the user intents uh, need to be inferred from free text. This is quite different from uh, traditional search and recommender systems where uh, users uh, have a query box and uh, they click and, uh, and, uh, and uh, rate items and so on. Uh, conversational information access is mixed initiative, so the user and system both actively participate, and uh, the results are no longer restricted to a ranked list of items, but uh, it's usually a text of arbitrary length that can also include uh, other uh, elements. Uh, we need more advanced natural language understanding capabilities to be able to uh, interact with users using uh, uh, natural language conversations. But this is something that uh, large language models have uh, been an enabling technology. Um, some preliminaries, just that we, we speak the same language in this part. So we assume that the, the dialogue is a sequence of terms, and each turn is a natural language utterance that comes either from the user or from the system. Uh, we assume that uh, 
for each utterance, there is a dialogue act, which represents the high level intent. And it's a, a tuple, which has a, an intent part and optionally some uh, slot value pairs that are uh, parameters. And then um, depending on the, the, the main, the set of dialogue acts need to be specified uh, with respect to the objectives of, of the application in that domain. There are different uh, taxonomies. So for example, in the dialogue state tracking challenge, where uh, the user goals are related to uh, travel, uh, tourist information, restaurant booking, they have an appropriate set of uh, uh, dialogue uh, acts. Now, uh, in terms of uh, simulator architectures, we can distinguish between modular and end-to-end -end systems. Uh, the modular systems on the left represent uh, user responses on the level of dialogue acts, and then they generate the natural language utterances from these dialogue acts. End-to-end -end systems, on the other hand, operate on the level of utterances, so they generate natural language utterances directly. And uh, there, uh, these are fundamental uh, differences. The, the modular systems on the left give more control over uh, how a response is uh, generated. And they can still leverage large language models for uh, natural language understanding and generation but the, the dialogue management is uh, typically taken care of by some, some policy. And uh, in end-to-end -end systems, uh, the, the uh, dialogue might seem more fluent, uh, but uh, there is limited control over how those uh, utterances are generated. Uh, let's look at the components of modular systems in a bit more detail. So uh, it starts with the natural language understanding where an incoming uh, uh, system utterance is uh, turned into a uh, semantic representation, the dialogue act, uh, which concerns the detection of the intent, uh, which is often approached as a classification task and uh, slot filling, which can be a sequence labeling problem. Uh, by the way, this is uh, this mirrors very closely the architecture of a uh, uh, task-oriented dialogue system. It's just that we are modeling uh, uh, the user, so we are using it to simulate the user and not uh, not uh, the system. Uh, but the components uh, are the same. Um, we have dialogue management, which is responsible for maintaining the dialogue state and deciding what the next user action uh, should be. And then natural language generation that turns this uh, generated response from a structured representation into natural language. And this can be based on templates, this can be a retriever based, uh, it can be a rural text generation or a hybrid solution. One additional component uh, is user modeling, uh, which, uh, which is uh, unique to user simulation in uh, task oriented dialogue system this uh, is not present in this form and this is to capture the characteristics of the individual that we are uh, modeling so this uh, influences both uh, the dialogue policy so what is it uh, that how they would react in a given situation but also possibly the natural language generation depending on the user's characteristics they might articulate the same intent uh, uh, differently. Um, so the user dialogue policy is uh, what decides uh, the next action uh, that uh, the user should take uh, given the dialogue history. And um, here uh, we are approaching uh, the task as a, as a task oriented dialogue in the traditional uh, uh, so-called slot filling uh, sense, which means that uh, 
there's a domain ontology that describes the specific intents, slots, and entities that can be talked about. And the user specifies the uh, constraints in terms of uh, a set of slots and also what they are requesting in terms of uh, requestable slots. And as we will see, uh, this is a, a appropriate or it's a natural fit for certain information access uh, tasks like a conversation and recommendation. Uh, and it requires a bit more work to adopt it for uh, uh, information seeking or expert research. So if you look at uh, some um, models uh, in a, in a, put them in, in, in temporal order. So the, the start from the oldest and, and move forward to more recent approaches. Uh, the first one is uh, um, a very simple model that uh, conditions the next response on the dialogue history. Now, this is uh, uh, something that uh, would be very difficult to estimate in uh, practice because the observations would be very sparse. So a very strong simplifying assumption is made that the next user action is only conditioned on the preceding system action. It's called n-gram models because it resembles uh, yeah, statistical language models. So it uh, it might be seen as a as a bigram uh, or very similar to, to a bigram uh, language model. And uh, this uh, allows for these conditional probabilities to be estimated from an annotated dialogue corpus. Uh, the issue is that this model has no information about the user goal. Uh, or no constraints on on uh, how the simulated user should behave, and it often therefore fails to produce realistic dialogues. Uh, to make sure that the conversation is uh, progressing towards some goal, an extension of this model is to have an explicit representation of the user goal, and it's expressed as a sequence of uh, slot value pairs along with the priority. So the, the, the role of a priority is that when, when the user is prompted for the relaxation of some attribute, then the ones with low priority will be more likely to be relaxed. And we represent the dialogue history at each point in time as a vector, where each vector element is the count of the occurrences, the value has been provided for the corresponding slot. This representation allows for the system to know which slots have already been mentioned, and it can take initiative to prompt the user for values of the missing slots. Another advantage of this representation as it, as it allows for uh, automatic evaluation of the task completion. Um, another extension and a very influential model is the agenda-based simulator. It uh, factors the user state into an agenda and a goal. And the goal, as before, is uh, a tuple where we have a set of uh, domain specific constraints. For example, in the case of recent recommendation, the user wants uh, a bar where they can drink beer and the bar should be in a central area and they are interested in the name, address, and phone. Uh, number of that place. So this this is the goal, and the agenda is a, a stack-like structure that represents the pending intentions of the user. So that is a, a plan about how the user wants to accomplish that goal, and that plan is uh, updated constantly or continuously. Uh, the agenda is initialized by setting all constraints, in this case, to inform acts and uh, request uh, on the requestable slots. And as the conversation progresses, the agenda and the goal are dynamically updated. Um, more recently, uh, 
user simulators are uh, created in a fully data-driven manner from annotated dialer corpora. In this uh, table, uh, some of these approaches are summarized. Uh, where we can see the architecture, the input, output, and whether they are modeling goal explicitly, and whether they are single or, or multi-domain. Uh, looking at it from a high level, we can see that there is a tendency to move from uh, feature-based representations to more end-to-end -end approaches. Uh, we can uh, look at how each of these uh, represent uh, uh, the input and, and featureize it, but later approaches just take utterances as a input and uh, produce utterances. Um, in many cases, it's uh, still useful to have uh, dialogue acts for analyzing uh, dialogues. So uh, the last approach that also produces the dialogue act along with the utterance. Um, in the interest of time, I will not go into the detailed representation of, of uh, dialogue state. Uh, basically, uh, at each point in time, uh, there is a, typically a vector-based representation, which captures the most recent machine action. Uh, if there was some inconsistency between the uh, the slots that were understood by the system and provided by the user, and the status on the different uh, uh, slots. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, LLMs are increasingly more used in task-oriented dialogue systems, not just the purpose of the evaluation, but also for data augmentation. It could be for uh, uh, predicting user satisfaction or predicting the uh, next actions or for constructing data sets uh, automatically. Uh, I will not go into these because these are covered uh, in, in other tutorials at this conference. Uh, what I want to talk about in the remaining time is how we can use uh, these uh, architectures for uh, simulating the task-oriented dialogue in general for conversation you know, information access in particular. As I mentioned, conversation and information access encompasses uh, search recommendation and question answering. And these three are often blurred together, but uh, there are not that many data sets that actually have all these goals represented. So as of now, uh, simulators are typically developed in a goal-specific manner, so either for conversation recommendation or for search. In this case, I will start with the recommendation because that's more closely aligned with the, the architecture, and then I will talk about search. Um, one thing we need uh, is a, a set of uh, actions for uh, defining the space of uh, you know, possible user and system moves. And uh, there have been uh, different taxonomies proposed for specifically for conversation information access. This is uh, one of those taxonomies where uh, the user can uh, uh, it has a set of actions for revealing the, the information need and then to inquire about the set of results, uh, to navigate the results, to interrupt the system, and to interrogate the system if they want to understand, for example, where the, why those results are given to them. And the system also has a similar set of actions to understand what the user wants, uh, present results, uh, uh, provide suggestions and explanations. Uh, I will skip this one. So uh, for conversational recommendations, uh, this uh, modular architecture can be uh, employed. And, and uh, in this work, the authors uh, address the problem of uh, you know, uh, finding an item that the user would like. Uh, so the 
conversation system elicits uh, user preferences and then present suggestions. And the goal for the user is to find an item that they would they would like. Um, in this case, uh, the NLU is uh, um, based on a sample of annotated dialogues. Uh, since many conversational systems, <laughs> sorry, um, use template-based natural language generation uh, from a small sample of interactions with such a system, a uh, quite accurate NLU, NLU uh, can be uh, built. Uh, the dialogue policy is uh, agenda-based and it's guided by an interaction model. And this interaction model specifies uh, the set of user actions and the expected system responses. Um, it assumes that uh, uh, the, the illustration shows the dialogue flow from the user's perspective. And for each of these actions, there is a corresponding uh, system action. And depending on whether the system responds in an expected way or not, and we, we know if the agenda needs to be uh, updated or, or it can just uh, move on to the next uh, action. The user model is based on a preference model, and this is grounded in actual user preferences by sampling from a historical uh, item rating data. And there is a notion of a personal knowledge graph, uh, which ensures that the, uh, these preferences are consistent. And then the, the natural language generation part is based on uh, templates using a number of different articulations for each intent. Now, uh, an interesting question is how can we validate that this uh, simulator uh, produces, uh, uh, you know, human-like uh, uh, dialogues? We can look at the uh, individual utterances, and commonly what is done is that human raters are given uh, generated responses, and they are asked to rate them along uh, different dimensions, such as uh, naturalness, usefulness, grammar. Uh, we can also look at uh, individual dialogues side by side, where one is produced by a human user, another one is produced by uh, simulated users. And then uh, another set of human assessors have to guess which of these is produced by a human. So we can look at high level statistics on a set of uh, uh, dialogues. Uh, for example, uh, uh, dialogue length or past completion rate. Uh, as mentioned in the beginning, uh, we want the simulator to be able to detect the uh, relative differences between systems. So one way to evaluate uh, a simulator or validate is to see if it produces the same relative ranking across systems. In this study, they compared three systems and uh, reward and success rate are the two evaluation measures uh, that are used for comparing systems. And the first row is uh, system performance using real users and then different variations of a simulator. And in um, most cases, uh, there is a, a perfect uh, alignment with the uh, real users. Uh, in one case, uh, in terms of success rate, uh, the most advanced simulator uh, swaps two systems. Uh, it, turns out to be more effective than actual users. So that's always a, a danger with user simulators is that uh, they sometimes perform better than, than real users do. And uh, that's not something uh, uh, we would want. Uh, if we move uh, to conversational search, then uh, um, we can um, consider two types of uh, user utterances. Uh, questions uh, initiated by the user and responses to system initiated questions. Um, 
there are more possible actions, but uh, to date there is no end-to-end -end simulator that would consider all those uh, actions, but rather they tend to focus on these uh, two uh, specific types of user utterances. Uh, in this work by Lipani at uh, all, uh, it's assumed that the user wants to learn about uh, a set of subtopics by interacting with the system. And uh, at each dialogue turn, they would ask about a particular subtopic. And depending on how the system responds, they can continue interacting with the system or not. Um, this is uh, based off of uh, track test collections. So uh, in order to simulate these interactions, there is a need for a set of topics. For each topic, uh, a set of uh, predefined uh, subtopics. We also need subtopic level relevance judgments and then a dialogue data set with these subtopic annotations. So it, it does require uh, quite a, a, a specific uh, uh, data, but most of it uh, can be repurposed from existing track uh, collections. And then uh, this is a, a interpretable uh, policy uh, that's based on a probabilistic uh, model. Uh, the next work focuses on simulating how users would respond to clarifying questions that take a particular form. And uh, here they have a, a user model uh, where the, the behavior is characterized by two variables, cooperativeness and patience. And uh, cooperativeness is the, the user's willingness to help the system by giving an informative answer. So on one extreme, a non-cooperative user would simply answer with yes or no. And on the other extreme, a cooperative uh, user would also elaborate on this was not what they were looking for, then explain what is it that they were looking for instead. And patience is a maximum number of terms the user is willing to spend interacting with the system. Uh, a more advanced approach uh, to simulating answers to clarifying questions is uh, where the Questions are no longer restricted to this, this uh, specific format. Are you looking for a, a facet and then um, um, that, that facet variable is substituted? But uh, it can be more open ended clarifying questions. And uh, they train a GPT 2 model uh, by giving both useful and uh, non-useful or, or distracting answers. Um, and then uh, at the inference time, uh, the model is prompted with uh, the input um, information need the clarifying question and uh, um, the simulator would generate an, an answer based on this uh, trained model. Taking it uh, further, um, with the uh, large language models, it's uh, actually possible to generate a variety of utterances by a few shot uh, prompting uh, a model. And this includes uh, queries to seek information, answers to clarifying questions, but also feedback to system responses. So, um, this is a more end-to-end -end simulator in a way. It does not uh, necessarily uh, restrict uh, the responses to those predefined intents, uh, nor does it necessarily uh, distinguish between uh, the explicitly about the, the, the type of uh, the intent. It produces a answer, a plausible answer that would be given by a human. And as mentioned before, uh, these are fluent and natural sounding, 
but now we have a simulator that uh, operates much like a black box. So the, the behavior of the simulator is controlled by the prompt, or in case it's a fine-tuned model, then it's controlled by the training data that's uh, given to the model. All right, uh, so that concludes the conversation part. And then I hand it back to Cheng for the concluding part. Yeah, thanks. And so then we're going to just summarize this tutorial. I think uh, here are the main points we have made and I think the high level takeaways. Uh, first, there's a critical need for using this kind of methodology to automate evaluation of uh, information access systems, but also more generally intelligent interactive systems that are serving users. And this kind of evaluation methodology covers existing evaluation methods as special cases, even though they don't call it a simulation, they are choosing, they are using simulation and just without the articulating the users being simulated. And the advantages of this simulation advantages include it enables reproducible experiments with evaluation of interactive systems at scale. And, and the second benefit is that allows us to test these systems under conditions that could not exist in real world, or you know, it's harder to create such conditions, or when uh, the system um, you know, was not thoroughly tested, and then we don't want to deploy such a system in real world. This kind of methodology can be used to evaluate those systems and to do kind of factual analysis of what would happen. So it facilitates research on those systems. Most uh, specific work uh, that has been done so far has been in the information retrieval community, mostly simulating uh, users. Uh, behavior when interacting with the search engine, and so including query formulation, you know, scanning documents, uh, clicking on documents, stopping. And you know, so most work has been done in that, uh, that kind of context, so not so much in recommended systems, although uh, recently there has been more work there. But interestingly, there has been also a lot of work for conversational assistants, likely enabled by large language models. So. So I think so that's a very high level summary. We covered a lot of details, but still within the time the time for the tutorial, we uh, were not able to explain all the ideas clearly. So if you're interested in those in detail, then you can take a look at the, the book. It has much more elaborate discussion and also references like there. Overall, the situation that we've seen a lot of component level solutions to modeling that action for a, a different national study users behaving in a particular scenario. Not so much in, in, you know, on the you know, simulation of a company user, even in the case of search, and not so much, although there are some toolkits that can help such in simulators, but overall, this is the main direction that we need to work on how to integrate with them, especially with the sort of the model business process framework or kind of workflow and that can tie everything together. So, now in terms of future directions, I think the first thing is perhaps given that we have seen a lot of work, why? Are we not using such methodologies in track or NCPI or CLAY, all those evaluation um, initiatives? And so perhaps we, we we thought that perhaps there are several factors. One is the complexity of creating very stupid simulations. People still feel that these simulators are not uh, comprehensive enough. Also, a lack of consensus on simulation based evaluation methodology. We certainly hope our tutorial and hope will help us. Kind of think more about the, how to define this kind of methodology in a more, more kind of uh, acceptable way or kind of the best way to define it. And there are open questions regarding the validity of simulation. I think that is tied to the interpretation of a connotation of the word simulation. When we simulate some, something, it's, it kind of implies it's not the real thing. And 
you know, when we use real users to make that assessment, that we are simulating some process users. And also, we need resources to develop and run those simulations. It's harder for a research group to do that. So that implies that the next steps, we should um, try to do something here. And we should level the existing test collections, maybe turn them into simulators. And, and we should also consider organizing some evaluation activities regularly with large initiatives, again, track and CPIR, play all the contents to evaluate both user simulators and then to leverage user simulators to evaluate the systems. And maybe comparing this kind of evaluation with traditional evaluation. And so that's one direction. The other direction that we think, I think that we can also work together on is to host industry and the academia collaboration. And I feel particularly this has already been happening. People collaborated, but there's some barriers such as the data privacy that prevent the industry apps from releasing data sets for academia researchers to use. But perhaps this, this simulation methodology provides a good way to remove this barrier in that we can have industry apps release, train the user simulators instead of their real user data. The simulators may be good enough for the academia researchers and to study uh, IR algorithm and also study algorithms to build uh, simulators. So we might even be able to create some kind of self-sustainable innovation ecosystem by having algorithms that we talked about here in open source and the industry labs can use these algorithms to train real simulators based on their search log data, real user behavior. And then they publish these simulators. Then we can use these simulators to then evaluate all kinds of systems that depending on the specific user simulators uh, you know, release. And in fact, if Bing or Google can release a lot of user simulators, simulate their real users, then we actually could start a web search engine and to, to, um, to evaluate the interactive web, web search systems. So if we can do that, then I think that we'll make progress in developing algorithms by using these simulators we will develop better interactive algorithms or conversational search algorithms. And industry hopefully can benefit from these better search algorithms and they can deploy those algorithms. Hopefully that will give them incentive to deploy more user simulators or you know, develop a, a future simulators to simulate the conversational system users. So that's another direction that we think that that's promising and we can work together to, to make this happen. In terms of the ch technical challenges, and perhaps the biggest challenge is the realism. And this is basically the challenge of measuring how realistic a uh, user simulator is as compared with the real user. And this is, you can easily imagine why this is difficult because when we say a real user, real users even vary a lot. And let alone, you know, comparing two users in multiple aspects and can you say for sure that's similar or not? It depends on the perspective. So this is a complicated problem, but we cannot escape from this problem. So, Mathematically defining the problem remains a major open challenge. You might have tied it to also the applications and how do we use it. I think this challenge is summarized uh, very well in the note uh, in the simulation for IR workshop that uh, Christine and the co-organizers organized a couple of years ago. And I just read it. It remains an open question as to how realistic that is human life simulators can be or indeed should be. It is important to note that simulators do not need to be perfect mirrors of human behavior, but instead simply need to be good enough. By this, we mean that output from simulations should correlate well with human assessments on a given task with respect to some evaluation metric. The main requirement is to reproduce better. I think this really summarizes very well about the situation. Both in terms of the challenge 
and also the opportunity. And so, yeah, speaking of opportunities, there are really interesting opportunities for in the discipline research around this big topic. And that's also shown in the two tutorials that Christian mentioned earlier that, that happened yesterday at this conference. There are also relevant kind of discussions at other conferences, I'm sure. And this is because the, the talk uh, is already started by multiple communities, for example, information retrieval community, particularly in a conversational search kind of context when people start paying more attention to user interactions and recommended systems. And it's likely moving toward conversational recommendation, the boundary of search recommendation in the conversational paradigm likely will also disappear. It's probably not so uh, clearly defined distinct as today. And the other area is aging the systems. And this is because we are now building in, in conversation or aging to help them for solve problems. And this kind of system likely would become more and more popular. And how do we evaluate such a system generally requires simulating the users that will receive that, that assistance. And of course, in many AI areas, large data and machine learning, all these areas, we see challenges posed by user simulation and also opportunities to study those challenges. In the case of machine learning, and we see particularly reinforcement learning likely uh, will have a lot of use in learning a user simulator agent. And that's very natural because the agent will be defined based on a bubble decision uh, process framework where reinforcement learning is natural to learn the policy to drive the simulator to behave in a way that's similar to you, real users. And so the data collected from real users can help uh, reinforcement learning here, but then uh, the, the agent itself can also interact with, with the systems and in many ways to, to learn uh, how to interact with the system. And um, natural language processing is another area in AI that's clearly very much related to the reason the development of large language models certainly open up a lot of opportunity to simulate the user's interaction, especially in conversational systems. Because otherwise, how can you simulate the user's actions? Those are natural language sentences. But fortunately, many large language models enable us to do that. And finally, in HCI and psychology, you know, we actually see interesting intersection here in that we can benefit from using their theory and their frameworks, like uh, information foraging, as was mentioned earlier in the tutorial, could be used to design a foraging kind of behavior for, for user simulator. At the same time, I think we offer an uh, interesting new methodology for those HCI and psychology research. Uh, in terms of formally describing a user and uh, a kind of hypothesis about users that are represented in the form of uh, aging, then they can test the aging and compare the, the, the behavior with real user behavior. So that opens up a lot of interesting opportunities. Perhaps there's some opportunity to organize some kind of broader workshop or engage with people in, in different uh, um, communities to work together on this, this topic. And finally, we have to talk about the user simulation at large language models. This topic has already been kind of mentioned a few times during this tutorial, but it has been dealt with in more depth in a few other tutorials, and there are many research papers about this. But uh, generally speaking, I think this is, um, you know, large language models in a way have been able to uh, simulate or mimic a human language ability, language proficiency. So this, of course, then um, allows us to kind of um, to simulate a lot of human behavior in terms of natural language generation and also understanding you know, or reaction to, to content. And this is also because large language models have been trained with a huge amount of text and those are Text is generated by humans or conversations. And so there, there's already a lot of behavior encoded in the, in the language model. 
So and now this is a list of some recent work replicate the existing social science studies generating open ended questionnaire responses, agent based modeling and autonomous agents and like in these different areas as, as covering the survey yesterday. Like, and, and the other point is um, prompt the design and providing a large language with appropriate context uh, play a major role. If you look at a lot of existing studies, most of the time it is to design some kind of prompts to uh, encourage the large language models to behave in a certain way in hope of simulating user. Now, although large language models can understand the instructions, and they might do that, but their ability of doing that is still limited, and they cannot be trusted to behave really like a human. And so there's still the trustworthiness and also the interpretability issue here. And they, their behavior itself could be uncertain because the next version of the large language model might have forgot some older skills, so their behavior may no longer be the same as before. So that all makes it uh, also a challenge in, in doing this kind of simulation. But it, it, you know, it, it, there are um, still opportunities and questions. So I mentioned the interpretability, transparency, right? and the controllability is also limited because we can only prompt them or fine tune. It's still kind of uh, indirectly controlled. We cannot have a kind of more human system two mechanism to really ensure it follows certain pattern. However, I think uh, there, there has been some recent work that tried to put some rule-based approaches on top of large language models so that it's not entirely rely on large language models to manage user, but with some kind of interpretable mechanism that might be um, more reliable, more interpretable um, to capture some aspects of human behavior. And, and there, there are some specific examples covered in this tutorial at this site here. They, they talk a lot about the, the use of large language models in designing a simulation agent. I think that, that direction is quite promising because it's closer to human system too, in that the high level, those rule based or template based approaches give us confidence in the behavior, overall behavior. And then large language models are used to implement a specific behavior, like generating some text or consume certain content. So yeah, so um, well, the lack of controllability and interpretability uh, also leads to the, the challenging modeling variations of users. And it's not that easy, although language models can be prompted to vary, but again, it's because of the lack of control, we cannot really guarantee that. In comparison with some interpretable models with explicit plan parameters that we can control, certainly for evaluation, the second kind of models will be more useful because that allows us to easily change the parameter and then say confidently, you know, in this kind of setting, how the systems behave. Did it change the, the results of the system evaluation? And it seems more, more interpretable. Okay, and finally, and it's a point that I touched at the beginning of the tutorial that is perhaps we can view user simulation as a step toward uh, artificial general intelligence. And because the general goal of developing a realistic user simulator may be similar to the general goal of developing human like and intelligent task agents. And if we want a human, uh, a task agent to be more human-like, it just means it needs to kind of to be able to simulate humans. And needs to have a, a user model that's in the form of a user simulator so that it, um, the agent can interact with users you know, in a human-like manner. And so they may be, um, so, so on the one hand, we have the intelligent task agent that have to be more and more human-like. On the other hand, when we do user simulation, we start with human-like, but we increasingly would have to model uh, and simulate the complex behaviors of humans, including their problem-solving ability, their ability to answer a question. If you cannot simulate that ability, you cannot then evaluate the system that can ask a user question. And so how do you encourage the system to 
ask the user question, you have to use a simulator needs to be able to answer a question. And if you want to build that kind of user simulator, the user simulator actually starts to look like an intelligent agent that can answer questions. So these two seem to be approaching the AGI from two different ends. And the large language models you know, have made both easier. So maybe it would actually enable us to, um, to accelerate right, this integration. And that's another reason why we see perhaps around the large language models, the synergy of different studies of, of user simulation that we can all maybe um, work together. So I think that's it. Maybe I can go to you for discussions. There are some minutes. Oh, we can ask them. Oh, we have time. We can ask if there are any questions. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's see if I have any questions. And well, yes. Thank you very much for a great talk and presentation. Uh, uh, I saw me at this part of this presentation. We can see the simulated user that uh, asking to a question about the stuff. Yeah, how do we simulate the user? How do we simulate the user? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a good question. But uh, my question is more general or more theoretical, actually. So if we really create, I don't want to say that the, the user simulators cannot be useful for, for studies, for uh, preliminary concerning the design, uh, all the ideas. But uh, I have one. I think quite significant, significant doubt about that. So, if we really create a user simulated user, uh, and we describe how this user behaves, so it's not more or less like a physical function, which is quite well known, and then designing the system to be tested by this user simulated user is actually the looking for the solution of this function. And if this function is well known, so we know everything about the user behavior, simulated user behavior, then the task starts to be a bit trivial in most cases. Uh, so just to find the solution of it, so to find the system who will recommend, uh, for example, the, uh, the product or the whatever to, to just fulfill the requirements of the simulated user. So I think that that, that that's the, the big gap uh, I see here. Uh, that's what the, the most difficult is that we really don't exactly know how the real user behaves. So we, we have only some gaps and only predict a lot of things, but there's a big gap and certain uncertainty. And that's, that's why it's interesting. And if you go for the uh, user, it starts to be a big gap of uncertainty. Yeah, so if I understand correctly, you're basically kind of touching this point. Can we really be sure it's it's uh, it's a realistic uh, user that will give us confidence in in doing any application? Is that part of the question? Uh, yeah, so more or less, it's not about whether it's realistic. Uh, if it's realistic, well, so for more theoretical discussion, what realistic mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If it means that uh, it's really replicate how the user behavior and we really know all inputs and all, all outputs, and then the user simulator behaves in the same way, we just say it's realistic. But in that case, we uh, we if we don't need the user simulator because we know everything about how it behaves. Yeah, I think this is yeah that's true because this is what this slide intends to convey. Right? So in on the one hand, you we want this to be as realistic as possible. But on the other hand, if you take two human beings, they are not same the same. You both want to be as similar to the other, and that seems to be um, also impossible. So, but on the other hand, even imperfect simulators could still be used for for uh, relative comparison of two systems. And so this is the perspective that we're thinking for evaluation. And we need to kind of make assumptions about the users. And those assumptions have been so far implicit that when they are using measures like a precision recall, ranking accuracy to compare two systems. And, but what we're saying that we, when in complicated systems, 
we actually need to really articulate the assumptions about user C. To some extent, what you said is, is precisely what we need to do. We need to just consider special cases, and we can only say for this kind of users, this system is better. For other kind of users, perhaps it's not, or some strategy is not uniformly better, unless you have really varied these users, and then say, well, this is always better. Uh, so I'm not sure if this addressed your question, but so it, I, I guess it's, uh, um, it's not necessary answer, but it's uh, it's a um, I think a pragmatic uh, uh, effort that we have to make in order to really evaluate the you know the interactive systems in a reproducible way. And otherwise, how would you do that? Uh, can I add yeah. something? So if, even if we know the the model uh, that uh, the user follows. And even if you know the parameters of those models, and we wanted to optimize the system against that, it's non-trivial because it's non-deterministic and the system can be very complex. So uh, there's no analytical solution. And uh, why is not deterministic? Because usually users yes but then we are optimizing against the average user and then systems should be personalized and then uh, the, even if we know all this there is a lot of room for a lot of headroom for systems to cater for individual users i think yeah, and in a specific case, what we need to do is to model this current user. Now, it's hard to model this current user. We have average behavior, and that's the prior. But as we interact with the user, we're adapted to, to model this user. And so we may have, and so this is related to also the two kind of two things that we are talking about, the, the intelligent task agent that want to be more human-like, and then the human-like the simulators that could increasingly simulate more capabilities. And I think even if you give the intelligent system this simulator, I mean, if you give it the, to the intelligent you know, task agent, it can optimize this policy based on average behavior. But when we need to adapt it to a specific user, it's still a challenge. The adaptation is still a challenge, unless we have you know, a perfect simulator for every user. In that case, then we, I guess, we solve the problem pretty quickly. Any other questions or comments? Suggestions? Yes. Yeah, so we ask about do we have any specific idea for doing that? I don't know, but it's something we have discussed, we hope to do. And then, if you have any, um, Suggesting or advice with a welcome that because you all you know, you're leading this kind of effort. NCTI has been running for many years successfully with a lot of tasks defined. How do we define a task from this perspective? Is something that that certainly we should work together. Yeah, I I think uh, you know, it will be exciting if we can have some kind of simulators that can allow us to evaluate uh, a system that currently cannot be evaluated. 
But before we reach that point, perhaps it's better to have a simulation track that can replicate some existing tasks, but evaluate it more from variation of different users' perspective to, to show this kind of methodology really um, works well or is consistent with what we have done in the past. You have more to say here. You've been also leading some effort on the live evaluation and all those things. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's difficult to find a task that uh, attracts uh, enough people. Uh, mm -hmm. So so we talked about web search, but uh, but uh, maybe web search is no longer that interesting for mm -hmm. for the research community. Um, Com conversational uh, agents are possibly more more interesting. Yeah, a different task, a more exciting task it would be more interesting. Otherwise, if it's a standard search people are not so interested in that. There's definitely some kind of conversation, I guess, conversational search or recommendation, you know, using simulators in that way. <laughs> <laughs> what is the time schedule for NCTI tasks? When when do you usually decide the uh, new tasks? So the next uh, then if we are doing something there mm -hmm. when is the next uh, deadline for submitting some proposal okay. thanks and uh, uh, this year uh, plenty of time to work out something <laughs> maybe during six hours there is some discussion Need to close. So, yeah. Yep. Um, I I just want to close by mentioning one more thing. Uh, we have a website uh, that's under development, but uh, but it's getting populated with new content. Uh, so we'll be posting uh, new book versions and also links to tutorials and slides. Those are already there, and we have an annotated bibliography in in the making uh, to. Uh, make available like summaries of papers, especially focusing on the conversational information access. And we have a mailing list that you can subscribe to. So if you're interested in simulation in general, then please subscribe. It's a low traffic mailing list, but uh, we plan to inform people about uh, upcoming uh, events and workshops and initiatives there. Yeah, so okay. with uh, that, thank yeah, you very thanks. much for coming. Yeah. Uh, let's be in touch maybe virtually and hope uh, we, we, have more. we also welcome criticisms of simulation. So any any questions like uh, 